Hey everybody, this is Ross Ratty and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables and how to use all that stuff in the kitchen. Um, but most of the time we talk about how to grow it. And we like to talk about the more weird and interesting fruits and vegetables that you have probably never heard of or have not even had a chance to grow yourself. However, in uh, tonight's episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to be talking about the sugar snap pea. And it's a pretty common vegetable. However, it is one of my favorites and I think it's severely underrated. And that's why I want to talk to you all about this particular vegetable with you guys. Now, normally we've been doing my podcast, Fruit Talk. We've actually done about 60 episodes now on YouTube. And that's where the bulk of my content is on YouTube. So if you're now listening on a podcast website like Spotify or iTunes, um, I would recommend go over and check out our content over on YouTube. We've been growing food now for about six or seven years. And I have had a YouTube channel um, for somewhere around three or four now. It's been a, it's been a long journey. Uh, we have somewhere over 20,000 subscribers there as of uh, May 12th, 2020, and we're growing. And I would like to, of course, uh, make my podcast available to all of you guys on iTunes, on Spotify, different podcast um, hosting websites, rather than just having it on YouTube. However, I will recommend that um, this podcast, a lot of it is visual. So uh, I try to use some visual aids and um, you're only going to be able to really see that on YouTube. So um, you also get to see me. However, um, this will be, I think, the first episode that we truly get my podcast Fruit Talk on these different podcasting websites. So I'm very excited with that. And this will then mark this episode as episode one and um, instead of episode 61. Um, so let's begin with the sugar snap pea. And um, I don't know about you guys, but peas are really, uh, growing up, have been probably my worst, my least favorite vegetable. I really despised them. I hated them. Um, especially frozen peas. I don't know about you guys, but I think if we were to poll all of America, we were to see how many people actually enjoy peas, I think the number would be pretty low. And the, the real answer and the real reason for that is that we are freezing them. And we're growing peas. There's different forms of peas that you can grow um, that really just aren't all that tasty, especially compared to the sugar snap pea. And that's why I think they're so good nowadays since I started growing them, since I started trying different peas and exposing myself to a lot of this information I'm going to share with you guys in this this podcast. Um, it really has been an eye-opening experience. And now I would argue that they are my absolute favorite vegetable. And I don't even consider them vegetables sometimes because they're so sweet. They're called sugar snap peas for a reason. They really do have a ton of sugar in them. And something we're going to talk about a lot in this podcast is something called bricks. So bricks is just a measure of soluble sugars within fruits and vegetables. And you can get yourself a refractometer and you can measure the bricks content in your different fruits and vegetables. And this is a pretty good indicator of the quality of the fruit or vegetable. It also will tell you the, the sugar content. And most of the time, this correlates really well with how good it's going to taste. So the sugar snap pea, in my opinion, can get really, really sweet. And because it's so sweet, I that's really the reason why I don't necessarily consider it a vegetable. It does remind me quite a bit as eating something as sweet as a fruit, and that's almost why I consider them um, something above a vegetable. Um, I do have some fruits for sure that I grow because we don't just grow 
peas. We grow all kinds of different fruits that we've mentioned on the podcast over the last 60 episodes, but things like currants and honeyberries, gumi, um, raspberries, blackberries, grapes, apples, pears, stone fruits, figs, persimmons, jujubes. So I have a pretty wide diversity of different fruit trees and shrubs and vines that I grow, and I've tasted a lot of them. Um, and I will argue that um, maybe the bricks isn't as high as some of the fruits. However, they definitely taste sweeter. And you could make an argument that something like uh, a red or a black currant or maybe a honeyberry or um, perhaps even a jujube, you could make an argument that uh, the sugar snap pea is sweeter, at least to the palate. Um, so for me, I think they're they're just so good. Um, when I eat them, I think about something that's very juicy, crisp, fresh, tender. Um, not a whole lot of fiber either, not a whole lot of strings, and then also something that's very sweet. So I guess the, the fiber is something I really want to get into now and the strings because this sort of leads us into the different types of peas. Now we sort of we're into that before before we segued but we were mentioning that there's peas that you can eat that are frozen and those are normally like I said shelled peas so people grow these peas and they'll get them to a certain maturity sometimes they'll even let them dry on the plant and you can rehydrate them and cook them later um, or you can get them and shell them and then start freezing them and that's the product that a lot of us receive and eat on a daily basis so um, it's not something that I, I truly recommend because those peas are just it's seemingly very inferior now is it the particular species or the particular type of pea I'm not entirely sure is it because they're frozen is it because they've been um, grown in probably unideal conditions is it because of the many many different reasons that there could be I'm not entirely sure what that reason is. However, I do know there's another type of pea, which is really just the pod is what you eat, which is something like a snow pea. Some people call them pea pods, uh, at least my family does. And they're commonly found in stir fries and Asian cuisines. And um, you can grow those too. Um, and you can grow even just a sugar snap pea as an example for the pods and use them like snow peas. Um, however, here's the big difference between the two. So, or the, between the three different types at least is that I would say that there's the shelling peas, there's the snow peas, and then there's the sugar snap peas. And I'm sure maybe there's another type here and there. I mean, there's so many different types within these different types. You know, some grow very tall, some are very short, um, some kind of do their own thing. I mean, you could really make an argument that there's more than just three types but the way I look at it again there's the shelling beans or the shelling peas that you use um, for drying or for freezing then there's the snow pea which is just the pod so for one the shelling pea you don't use the pod you only use the pea for the the snow peas you only use the pod but the sugar snap pea is the combination of the two it's the pod and the pea so this is where I think the the best of both worlds comes together into the best, perfect spring garden snack vegetable that you can eat. And uh, hopefully someone quotes me on that at some point. <laughs> but anyway, so the sugar snap pea, um, like I said, is the best of both worlds. So what you're trying to really achieve with the sugar snap pea and this is the honest truth between what you get at the store. And this is something we talk a lot about over the length of my 60 episodes now. The difference between growing food at home or getting it from a local farmer versus someone who is um, buying it at the store. The store quality is almost always inferior to what you can grow at home. And the reason for that largely most scenarios is because of when you pick the particular fruit or vegetable. So if I, as an example, get myself a peach off of my peach trees 
and I pick it at the ripeness level that most commercials grow, commercial growers pick it at, I have to wait about two weeks for that peach to sit on my counter before it will start to be soft and fully ripe. It takes about two weeks before I, after I pick it. So it's the same thing with the commercial growers. They pick them about two weeks before it's perfectly ripe. So if it's 100% ripe, it's the best peach you've ever eaten, straight off the tree, it's soft, right? Because the peaches will actually become tree ripened, soft on the tree on their own. You don't have to put them, pick them and put them on the counter. That's just not something that nature does. We do this simply because they're easier to ship. It's a better product on a, on a shelf because it's not as soft. They're hard. They're not going to bruise. They're going to be sellable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a really big distinction here. And the same thing happens with the sugar snap pea. And it's really a shame because I know a lot of people, including my mother, who love sugar snap peas from the store, from any grocery store. And I'll tell you, they just don't know what they're doing um, they're because they're missing out. It's really a shame. It's it's um, You're being robbed of an experience. And that is really, in a nutshell, why I do and grow all the different things that I grow. For the experience, for eating something that is an experience. Why do we buy $300,000 bottle of wines? Bottles of wine, I should say, <laughs> is because of the experience. That's why we do it. We don't do it to show off. I mean, maybe some people do. We don't do it to stock our wine cellar, although some people do. Um, I think the average person, if you're going to spend over $50 on a bottle of wine, you're going to do it for the experience. And that's the same thing with all these different fruits and vegetables that you can grow at home and get that same experience with really very little effort. And the reason why we have that experience is because we've been robbed. So it's a shame, but everybody knows, you know, growing food at home is better than getting it at the grocery store. But do you really know until you actually eat it and taste it yourself? Um, I don't think you do. I certainly didn't. So that's the big distinction there is that they have picked the sugar snap pea a lot earlier than what you would at home. And it really is a test of patience. Now, when the sugar snap pea gets to that perfectly ripe state, here's what it looks like and why you don't really you can't really sell it as easily cuz when they're nice and green and semi plump on the on the um I guess you could call them vines. I don't know what you would call them, I guess. Um you could say that they're nice green and plump and they look sellable at that point. But as soon as they get a little bit more filled in and the peas get larger, and they start to reach that maturity that is necessary and perfectly ripe, they start to really don't look all that great. Um, they don't look not nearly as sellable as if you had picked them, let's say, a week earlier. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a shame that that's the, the case, but that is really what happens is that people pick them, the commercial growers pick them about a week, I would argue, earlier than what you would do at home. Now, if you can let them ripen on the, let's say the vine at home, um, you'll have yourself much more plump peas on the inside and you can very easily tell um, what they look like. In fact, we just did a video on YouTube yesterday, um, really today, filming at the time uh, that I'm filming, it was filmed today. So I'm on this sugar snap pea kick because they're ripening now it's it's may 12th 2020 and um they're just so so good um so in that video we talked about really what they look like at every little stage um, along the way between what a commercial grower would pick and then what you would pick at home to get the best tasting sugar snap pea to then be blown away by the experience right um, so what you're kind of looking for is actually some really good, you know, almost like, um, kind of like, uh, 
you know, ridges like mountains and valleys in the in the pod itself. So the peas will form the mountains and then in between the peas will form the valleys, right? Now, the bigger the mountains and the bigger the valleys, the better off you are, at least in terms of um, that would some somewhat indicate how big the peas are getting themselves inside the pod because the peas are really what's good. Now, the snow pea has really a lot of strings in it and uh, you got to cook it. It's got a lot of fiber. It's kind of like certain string beans and different vegetables just, just have portions of it that have a decent amount of fiber. And if you don't cook it, kind of like the bottom of asparagus, right? We snap off the asparagus at a certain point and discard a lot of the fiber at the bottom. It's the same thing with the snow pea. However, the sugar snap pea has very few strings, not as much fiber. It's not as tough. It's actually quite tender. So what you're looking for is to eat them both together. However, the pea is really where the money's at. I know the pod doesn't get enough credit because it doesn't have as much fiber, but the pea is really where all that bricks and all that sugar is going to be. That's where all the flavor and experience that you're going to have is going to come from. So if you can let them get to the largest size possible, they're going to be sweeter as well. If they're going to be into their a further state into their maturity, they're going to be sweeter. Um, it's just a matter of time. Most of the things that ripen on our trees, our shrubs, our vines, our vegetable plants, whatever you want to call them, the longer they hang on there, the sweeter they usually become. Um, not across the board with everything, but certainly with these particular sugar snap peas, you could make an argument that up to a point, they do become sweeter. At the very least, you could say the pea is larger, therefore they seemingly are sweeter because the pea is now having a certain ratio, right? Between the pod and the pea. So there's more pea versus the pod. <laughs> now, if you were to compare um, something as an example like um, sushi in Japan, they will certainly have a certain amount of rice to the right ratio of fish. And if you mess up that ratio, it's not going to taste as good. With a lot of particular meats and carbs and things, when you combine them together, you want to have that right ratio. Lox on a bagel. Everyone always complains there's so much bagel for the amount of lox. It's the same thing. Um, I would much rather have very plump peas than smaller peas with my sugar snap peas. So that's a big one there. You just can let it ripen. You visually can see it. At a certain point, the pod will start to get a bit tough. So it's a, a tricky point there, a tricky time that you have to time it. You know, you want to be picking your fruits and vegetables almost every day. Um, this is something that's a really good snack. So it's easy to go out there in the garden. You're working really hard in the spring. Maybe you're sweating this is one of the best garden snacks to have when you're really working hard in the garden. Um, so how do you grow these things, right? I think I made a pretty good about argument here without really you guys tasting them, but let's talk about how to grow them. So what I um, have done is I've actually put out a couple videos now on the YouTube channel talking about seeding them and also talking about transplanting them into soil and um, actually I did this twice I did um, some of the seeds we put into a cold frame and those particular sugar snap peas because we had so many of them as you guys can see here on YouTube we had so many plants that I had a number of them for the pods and then I had a number of them in a different bed as you see here these were for shoots because not only can you eat the pods the peas but you can also eat the shoots the growth points of the pea, the entire thing's edible for the most part. I don't know, I wouldn't eat the roots, but um, the tips of the peas are really tender, taste exactly like peas. They're very sweet. They make an awesome microgreen. They're a really nice thing to top on salads or to add in the salads, add some texture to your food. Um, they're just wonderful. So there's a really big dual purpose there, but 
Starting them out is really quite simple. I start them, I believe I started them, I think February 1st. And I started them in these 128 cell trays. These cells are about a half inch by a half inch by an inch deep. Really not a whole lot of compost in here. We put two peas per shoot, I'm sorry, two peas per cell when we seed them and we transplant out each cell if they have two of the peas within the cell. Sometimes only one germinated and I over germinated because I had some extra plants and didn't end up keeping um, these particular plants. So if I didn't get the germination I wanted, I just had some extras and uh, would only choose these cells with two different sugar snap peas in it. So what I did was I took those after they grew for about two weeks indoors. I moved some of them out into the greenhouse. You can see this is February, 8, uh, February 19th, 2020. Put them in the greenhouse to get them hardened off. And then we transplanted them into the green into the cold frame. I'm sorry. I think sometime February 15th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it could have been March 1st. I have to look back at my dates to find exactly the right time. But essentially what you want to do is have them in these cell trays for two weeks and then transplant them out as early as you can into your garden. As soon as the soil is thawed, um, you want to have your sugar snap peas growing in the soil. They don't mind a light freeze. They can handle that. But what you should do if you are growing them very, very early, as I did, February 15th is extremely early. March 1st is extremely early. I would say for my climate, a good date for a lot of these cool loving crops because the peas love the cool weather. They don't like the heat. Brief lesson on the life cycle of these peas is that they grow uh, in cooler temperatures. As soon as the day length gets to a certain amount, they start to flower. They're more encouraged to flower. So they begin to grow, then they flower. They set their fruits, um, their pods. They ripen their pods. The pods dry up on the plant. And then sometime in, I would say sometime in June or July, maybe around the longest day of the year, the summer solstice you end up with sugar snap peas or peas in general that just stop liking life and they start to die because it's just too warm i think the sunlight probably the amount of daylight has some sort of effect on that but i think it's a lot a lot of that has to do with the heat if it's just too warm they won't grow nearly as well they won't perform nearly as well and uh they'll start to you know, go downhill from there. So, you know, that's sort of what you want to do is get them in the ground as soon as you can. We get them in the ground early, we're going to have a better chance of ripening all of the sugar snap peas or more of the peas throughout the season. Um, you could succession plant them and plant some maybe, you know, let's say March 1st, plant some March 15th, April 1st. But I find that if you just get them out early, because it's a tricky crop. If you don't get them out early like a lot of the brassicas, you're not going to succeed in a lot of climates. You just have to have them out early before it gets very warm. So a spring garden really starts in the wintertime. We talked a lot about that in our first 60 episodes. So that's what you got to do. Is I got them in somewhere around March 1st, let's say. Um, and then we transplanted them out. And here's actually, yeah, we did. We got them in February 15th um, for the pods. And then for the shoots, I planted them March 1st. And we planted them under protection because it is so early. You do want to protect them if you can. They, yes, they can handle a frost. We didn't see a frost until actually April um, 17th this year, which was insane. Um, so we didn't see any frost in March. And really none until April uh, 17th, but what it's a really good idea to do because it's not necessarily very warm out just yet, cover all of your cool oven crops with some mesh. There's fleece and there's mesh and there, it's, it's a row cover. You cover your rows 
with the mesh, what's really is going to warm up these plants and keep them about three to five degrees warmer than they otherwise would. Those soil temperatures go a very, very long way. Although they don't like to be growing at very warm temperatures, they also don't really grow if it's too cold. So you want to warm things up a bit. You don't want to plant them too early, but um, as early as you can normally is probably the best time to get them out. So that's what we did. We put them in the bed here, this raised bed. That's a southern exposure. Got a lot of sunlight, and we covered them with uh, with our mesh, and they came out wonderfully. Um, we got to use these in salads, even just snack on them. Um, the nice thing about having peas for shoots was that you could um, have them at a much earlier date than the pods and the peas themselves. So that's really the the most of the details there. Now there's one other thing I want to mention is that we're spacing these out even though in these cells there's two per cell we're spacing out each individual cell four inches and that's on center. I grow them very very close together. This variety that I grow is called Sugar Ann. It's a very sweet variety. It's a very early variety and it's a low growing variety. Um, it doesn't really get all that tall. So normally what people would do is plant them and have a trellis and have them grow up the trellis. That's not all that necessary. Um, for shoots, you may want to have something a bit more vigorous. You can harvest more shoots that way. However, these sugar and uh, sugar snap peas are so low growing, they kind of just form this nice mat, almost like a, a ground cover. And they sort of support themselves. They have these tendrils, they have growth points, they have flowers, they have leaves. The tendrils, similar to grapevines, help them latch onto things. And they just for, sort of form a clump and a mat, and they sort of support each other. And that's how they grow upwards. And um, it's a really nice method of doing it, at least for the sugar and variety. Um, and it comes out beautifully every year. They're very productive especially for the space that they're in. They're beautiful plants. They're very tasty. There's nothing really else to say. Um, yeah, so I hope that everybody out there that was listening to this episode of Fruit Talk, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this this episode. If you want to contribute and consider uh, supporting us on our journey here of the podcast, or maybe you're a fan of our YouTube videos, consider subscribing um, to our YouTube channel, but also maybe consider contributing on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Any little bit will greatly help, and I'd be much appreciated for any support. I want to thank you guys here for watching this episode of Fruit Talk, and I'm very happy, very pleased to have this episode now officially on Spotify, on iTunes, on other podcasting sites. Thank you guys and stay tuned for next week's episode. I think we're going to be talking about arugula. And if anybody has any sort of questions that they would like me to answer, we normally do some sort of live stream, um, maybe once a month on YouTube. So the podcast is then live streamed. We have a whole chat. People get to ask all kinds of questions. I'm considering in the future doing a a Q&A section of every podcast. So we'll answer people's questions um, every week um, at the end of every episode. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you guys here for watching this. I'm out. We'll talk to everybody soon. See you guys for next week's episode.